Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the Furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the links below to diamondbright.co.uk. Forget the last real rover. Today you join me at the wheel of the last actual rover. Today, For decades, every time there's been a new rover brought out, people would say, it's not a real rover. The last rover was the last real rover. Whether it's a 75 because that was a bit BMW. Whether it's a 200 and 400 because that was a bit Honda. Whether it's the SD1 because that was a bit Triumph from BL. Whether it's the P6 because that was too lightweight and rapid compared to the P5. It just goes on. People are always ready to make a fuss and complain. And then we have this, the City Rover. Not only the last real rover, actually the last rover. Now, it's not really a secret to say that this is basically a Tata Indica or a Tata Indigo, depending on what market you're looking at, with a different grille on the front. So did they make it different enough to warrant calling it a rover? Or was it just a cheap sellout that deserved to die with the company? Now, Tata have been making the Indica since 1998, but it wasn't until 2003 that it was brought over to the UK as the City Rover. Now, in order to roverize the car, they did a little, but was it enough? It could have been more, if I'm perfectly honest. So they did things that were pretty obvious. For example, the bumpers, the grille, I think the lights were changed at the front. The suspension was completely revised for European and UK style of driving on our roads as well. Um, around the back, the lights were changed as well. So they're almost punto-like in the, the kind of tall strip. It's like a safety feature really, so it makes them very high and visible and blends into the rear corner of the car. Now opening the bonnet, there is the flimsiest bit of plastic you've ever seen. And it looks like it's not actually hinged. It's, well, I don't know what it is. It's just flapping down below the dashboard. And I'm told you have to get this exactly right or you're stuck. Phew, we're in. Now we have the rather cryptically named 475 MPFI. Well, this is pretty obvious. Multi-point fuel injection, but 475? Four cylinders, 75 horsepower? Could be, but it's not 75 horsepower. 475 foot-pound of torque? Probably not. So what this is, is a heavily reworked, but Peugeot-derived 1.4 litre. In fact, it's a 1405cc eight-valve engine, which makes 85 horsepower and 88 foot-pound of torque which may not sound earth-shattering, but in a car as light as this, is actually pretty decent performance. In fact, it goes 0 to 60 in 11.9, which is okay for the class, and will hit 100 miles an hour. And apparently it'll get 38 miles to the gallon. So this whole front end was added by Rover. The car was built over in India, shipped over here, where it was roverized with things like this very, very late style badge. The Viking ship completely pared down to a very simple design by the very end of Rover. Now the front end, it does have more than a whiff of Punto on about it, doesn't it? Or so second generation Punto, if you look at it. This being a higher model does get fog lights and quite a lot of nice black plastic trim. Now the Rover versions of these things, all got 14 inch wheels and the better models got these alloys as well. Something that wasn't quite roverized enough though was deleting the Tata badges, which is a bit of a no-no if you're trying to sell a premium product. So here on the uh, mirrors, you've got a Tata badge. Here on the VIN plate and on the bottom of the parcel shelf, amongst other areas. Now this parcel shelf is where we start to run into <coughs> quality issues as this one is a tad broken. We also find on this particular car that the rear passenger door won't open from the inside, the front passenger door won't open from the outside, the driver's window is temperamental, the check engine light is permanently on and the oil light is sometimes on. Other than that it's fine. Right, so I've chucked the uh, passage off in the back so I can show you the boot because it doesn't lift up. The boot itself is quite a good size. It goes back far enough, goes up high enough. There's a bit of a lip getting things in, but if you just put your shopping in here, it's gonna stop your milk and eggs falling out. So fair enough, no problem at all. Um, the owner has added a genuine Rover accessory of this rubber floor mat, which is really nice. I've never seen one of these before. Um, Slightly surprisingly, it doesn't actually fit the boot. It's not quite the same shape as the boot, despite being a City Rover genuine accessory. But hey, it's a nice thing to have though. I would definitely go and source one of those if I had one. It cuts around the jack in there, so it's all actually shaped properly. Uh, what else do we have in here? Well, good news is we've got under the floor, 
a full-size alloy spare wheel, proper, proper spare wheel, and all the jacket and toolkit are tucked underneath this slam panel here. That's nice to have. That's got quite a sporty tyre on that spare wheel as well. You saw I've been enjoying this car in the past. Over here on the right-hand side, there is a courtesy light. Always a good thing, except it's not a switched courtesy light with the door. It's switched with a switch, so you have to manually walk over and turn it on if you want to see stuff in the dark. Now these rear seats do fold down completely. You can either fold them once and have a, a flat load space, or you can go like full on uh, Fiat Multiple of Vauxhall Zafira and double fold them. Unfortunately, the latches and catches are so fiddly, we're not going to do that today. There you go, we did it. It's a 40-60 or 60-40 split, so we've only done one half. But it, there you can see massive, massive load area. Very, very practical in such a small car. Right, so here we have the interior. And wow, for a small car, it's an impressive amount of space in here. The headroom is just vast. Got a pretty good elbow room. Lots of room for your feet and your knees. There's like virtually no transmission tunnel, but obviously front wheel drive, but you know, a console. So yeah, you're very, very spacious indeed. You feel a long way from the windscreen as well. You don't really feel penned in at all. Now there was plenty of criticism at the time the car was new in terms of the quality of the plastics and the fit and finish. And I have to say that some of it was justified. Uh, there's a panel here. It's quite clever how the panel for the uh, glove box and the panel that sits around the bottom of the steering column are interchangeable on left hand, right hand drive. So they've done a clever bit of design there. Unfortunately, the fitment on the driver's side one isn't particularly special. The airbag pod on the passenger side does look a little bit of an afterthought that was kind of tacked in and plonked on top rather than integrated fully. I'm guessing on cars without a passenger airbag, you have a full width, well, T-shelf basically. Now this model is a style, so it's the top of the range and gets everything, apart apparently from the metal uh, foot pedals, which were available on a lower level car, but not on the top level car. Go figure. So starting with our little tour on the door. First of all, this is a nice one, so we get the same velour-y fabric, velour in 2003, that's a good thing, um, here in the your door card. A fairly solid door grab handle, an okay door bin, a speaker, and apparently the speakers were terrible on this car, and the owner has just changed them for some aftermarket ones because he wanted some decent sounds in here. And then you have one of the few UK upgrades, which is the surround here for the door handle, isn't this kind of faux uh, carbon fibre effect stuff which is also found in the centre of the dashboard as well. The main plastic body of the door card is a little bit rattly and tacky. And uh, when you shut the door, it shuts really firmly with a good bang, but there's a little bit of an echo into the door, which makes you think it could have been, I don't know, more solid or... Down to the right of the steering wheel, we've got a little panel of four buttons, which is our kind of our secondary controls. Rear screen heater, um, rear wash wipe, front and rear fog lights, and don't forget front fog lights because it's a top of the range car. But every time you push one of these buttons, the entire panel does move with it. But above that, we have got big ventilation. There's not door ventilation going up to the window, but there is a side vent, which is always on. So it will always blow a bit of vent onto the window and try and keep it demisted. And these vents are big. They're just four nice sized blowers. And this car has got air conditioning. It's a top of the range car loaded with all the options. So we've got air con on this particular model, which does blow very cold indeed. Now we have the steering wheel. Now, this is a leather wheel, which you think, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, now, because this car was an Indian built car originally, it's not cow's leather, it's pig's leather, which is very soft and supple, quite nice feeling material. If you buy a, a pig skin wallet, that's kind of a luxury item. Um, however, it's quite thin though, and it's notably uh, worn off here where your hand sits most. Although the owner has now picked up a brand new sealed fresh one from Rimmers for, I think it's a 10 pounds. 10 pounds? Yes, £10 for a leather steering wheel. That's amazing. Now, one thing which is less amazing though is the Rover badge in the middle, which looks a little bit cheap. It's not got very much detail in the Viking ship and it kind of is a bit like when Aston Martins have got the Aston logo glued over the Ford or Volvo badge on the key. Um, has got the horn and has got an airbag. Let's try the horn. Yeah, that's a suitable horn for this car. We're in keeping. And finally, down below this whole area, we've got our headlamp angle thing for weight in the boot and a great big trough under, under here. So you can pile all manner of items under the steering wheel. And in front of you, looking through the wheel, we have got our pod of dials, white race inspired dials. 
big centre speedo and then interlocking outer ones look a little bit kind of Honda ish in a way high perhaps inspired by Honda uh, I quite like the double cluster on the right with the fuel and the temperature gauges they look quite good and the bright red needles looking very racy indeed uh, claiming to go up to 125 miles an hour I suspect it may not in fact no we're not it's a little 100 now below the dials we've got a nice row of lights which hopefully aren't on too much but in the centre the one confusing me at first is the padlock for the alarm and actual old-fashioned LED in the middle of it very old school technology and because it's printed like a sticker onto the panel I thought there was a problem with the central locking when I first climbed into the car it's not it's it's ink it's stuck on there now we come to the centre console now first of all we have to get this out of the way there's no cup holders where was my big teacup gonna go I don't know what, what were they thinking but okay that's a disappointment but 10 out of 10 a plus star for the tea shelf look at the state of this okay it does rattle a bit when you bang your hand onto it so I won't do it anymore um, but it is huge we've got lots of room for two cups of tea you've got sandwiches you've got swiss roll you can put a proper victoria sponge on there and you've got height to cut it as well so we're very happy with that and it has a little rubber mat so after your picnic you can take the crumbs outside shake them outside the car everything is thought off here this is a great picnic mobile less great is the little digital clock in front of it it does look a tad cheap uh, hours minutes and and zeds because zeds i'm looking at the owner for explanation he's no clue either he's, he's read the handbook um so is zed the month hang on i'm gonna sound like i've not researched his car at all right now but um okay the clock is actually broken, so um, I can't tell you what Z stands for. Maybe it's got a lap timer. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but hours, minutes, and Z. Maybe it's nap time. We can set a, a nap timer on it. Porsche's got a lap timer. City Rover's got a nap timer. I don't know. Where am I going with this? Anywho, right, now. The centre control panel has got this same uh, carbon fibre effect pattern on it, uh, which brightens the interior a bit, otherwise it's all just elephant skin everywhere, which is quite hard to the touch, so it's nice to have a little bit of brightening. This is quite a nice thing to have. The um, hazard warning lights are in the centre of it. That is a slightly small plasticky button, but it does the trick and it's easy to find. And below that we've got our good old-fashioned heating and ventilation controls, as I say with air conditioning, which is excellent. Uh, different texture plastic again here. And moving down into the Blaupunk Laguna CD36 stereo, which we think is probably a dealer fit option. Uh, it certainly looks of the period of the car, so it's a nice thing and it seems to work quite well. Below that again, we've got our lighter socket, 12 volt and fag lighter, and little pull out ashtray which is just right for sweet wrappers and then a little cubby hole down the bottom which is perfectly sized for an iPhone to sit in and well maybe not just about the right size for an iPhone to sit in and not quite give you Siri instructions then we have the window winders because this is a top of the range car style and select got four electric windows the two lower models didn't they have wind up keep fit windows this is good though but clever budgetary saving putting one panel of electric window switches here in the center means they haven't got to have a bank of window switches here and one on the door now this is a slightly curious placement for the airbag uh, deactivate switch normally it's something you hide in the glove box and the door shut so it's not a main control that you use very often and it's something kind of hide away this is here front and center right in front of the gear shift so uh, yeah they chose to put it there then we have the gearbox. All cars came with a five-speed manual, which um, is a good thing in my book. Although this is a little bit rubbery. It's a bit like the old Rover R8 gear shift in that there's a little bit of play, a little bit of rubberization in the selection. So you do feel a bit like it's not as accurate as you perhaps like it to be. And of course, we have got a nice manual chunky handbrake, and that's most of your controls. Next to the accelerator, there's a big cutout for your foot. So your foot can kind of slide off the accelerator and have room for your toes. And on the passenger side, they've mirrored it. So left and right hand drive cars have exactly the same mirror option. They haven't got to change that on the production line at all. One light on which is a very roverish thing indeed, which makes you feel like you're driving a proper rover, certainly an R8 series rover, is the uh, fuel cap release and boot release down here in little tags by your right foot. Now the last thing to look at up here is of course the sun visors which do feel a little bit flimsy and there are some fairly 
exposed screws, which is something you wouldn't really expect in a car later than, say, not 1990, really. Um, a little venti thing you can put stuff in for keeping on the driver's side, and there's a mirror on the passenger side, which is hidden, quite creatively, by a magnetic flip-down cover. Right, typical of many small cars. Climbing in the back, you do have to watch your nose as you get in, but once you are in, the headroom isn't too bad, but there's a slightly claustrophobic feel because it does wrap around you in the headlining a bit. Uh, legroom and footroom. Oh, brilliant, actually. I've got this seat set quite well back, and they're very, very thin seat backs, to be honest, so they're not taking much room out. Um, something about the car, because of its kind of fairly cheap um, origins, you can see lots of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily see or would not expect to see on a Rover in the noughties. For example, all the, the bracketry mounting the seats, the bolts holding the seat belts in, they're all, all exposed. Even the screw heads here on the, um, the rail in the bottom, uh, on the plastic trim, that's all exposed as well. One area they did try and disguise the uh, exposed fittings with was in the centre of the tunnel. They velcroed a bit of carpet over the back of it. And that's not really something you would expect to see on a car of Rover's level. This is something you'd expect on a real budget car, not on a Rover. But they've tried to make up for it with a bungy a bit more equipment in. You've got a little foldy outy ashtray, like in a 1970s Ford. We always used to like playing with them when we were kids. Electric windows, a slightly uh, curiously placed and feeling switch actually in this little alcove here because the lower options, as I say, did have keep fit windows. And you've got an uh, identical uh, door handle and locking switch to the front. But again, we've got exposed countersink screw um, heads in these handles, which is not what Rover should be selling in the noughties. That's not good enough, Rover. Right, let's take it for a drive and see what it's like on the road. So, fit and finish aside, the big question is, what's this thing actually like to drive? Well, let's find out. Well, the 85 horsepower engine is actually not bad. It's uh, got a bit of an old school 80s almost vibe to the way it delivers its power. It's quite throaty and raspy sounding, but it feels like it's got a fair bit of torque for the weight of the car. So you do pull away quite happily and you can move up into the higher gears pretty rapidly at not too high a speed. And it will push you to relatively rapid speeds quite quickly, which is where things get awkward because the suspension really isn't quite as good as the, uh, the engine, if I'm perfectly honest. Because not only does it lean like a ship in a gale on a corner, if we just pause a second and join us, rejoin at a bumpy road. Okay, so then we've got some weird undulations in the road here and the car feels like it's almost going to, oh my God, nearly took off. It's actually really dangerously out of control. It's hilarious. Oh my word. So yes, as well as not having a great deal of body control, when you do hit a corner, wow, does this thing lean. It's hilarious. It is a city car, obviously, so it's not designed to be driven hard through the country lanes, but even so, when you compare that to things like the Punto and the Fiesta, which were rivals, it's a very different experience. While we're talking about cornering, let's talk about the weighting of the power steering. It's very odd because as you get into a corner, it feels like it might be weighting up as sometimes power systems do. But the way it does it, oh, it closes now, it's better, a bit. Um, it's almost jerky, so you find yourself having a difference in pressure halfway through the corner, which makes steady cornering a little bit of a challenge. And everything, every control on this car is feather light. The pedals under my feet, feel like they're almost not there. The power steering is ridiculously heavily assisted considering how small and light the car is. You could almost do without power steering to be perfectly honest. The switch gear just feels so light, it's ridiculous. It, um, not like any previous Rover's switch gear. Like the RA had the famous Honda Civic stuff which was as tough as anything. This has got a slightly flimsier feel and the plastics are really slippery. Whoops. It's 
interesting how the suspension does handle the bumps and the turns because it was retuned to European and UK standards. Now shifting gears on this thing is a very familiar exercise for me because it feels exactly the same as my Rover Coupe. Although that is 27 years old and has 130 something thousand miles on it, this is not particularly accurate. It's quite a weird, vague feeling thing. It's a little bit odd. And coupled with, with the very, very high biting point on the clutch, which from old reports appears to be standard, it's a strange experience, not conducive to uh, rapid road driving. For all its other fit and finish and quality control flaws, the actual drive isn't too bad. It does feel like a Rover of old in some respects. The engineers have done a bit to, to make it Roverized. The seating position is actually pretty good. The visibility is amazing. It's like a massive goldfish bowl you're sitting in. And surprisingly, there are virtually no squeaks and rattles in the thing. And admittedly, the doors do clang a bit when you shut them, but the plastics aren't rattling. And the air conditioning blowing ice cold and keeping the windows nicely demisted as well. Now, I forgot to mention the brakes because when I was talking about the gearbox, I said the gearbox wasn't particularly special. Well, the gearbox is probably okay, it's just the linkage isn't that amazing. Also, a little on the scary side are the brakes. Let's get down to. So, we're going to sit at a nice steady 30 miles an hour, fourth gear, brake and clutch down. Whoa, and it's, mm, it's okay, but it doesn't give you any kind of feeling of confidence that you're actually going to stop. And the pedal does have a little bit of a rubbery feel to it, so. It's something you get used to, but when you first climb in and drive it, you do feel a little bit cautious of the brakes. Now, the owner of this car hasn't had it very long, and in fact just paid shy of a thousand pounds for it very recently, but that is for a pretty good condition example with a year's MOT on it. And I can't condone this, but he has been on the uh, Rumor Brothers website quite a lot and bought every possible accessory he can. Not that I'd do a thing like that. Okay, this is an impromptu 0 to 60 on the roundabout. Okay, a 0 to 35 on the roundabout. I did 0 to 30 very quickly indeed, but unfortunately just kind of ran out of puff much beyond that. But again, it's a city car, so it's kind of to be expected. Now, sales weren't a massive success as Rover had hoped during 2003 and 4. So towards the end of 2004, they dropped the price by 900 pounds. And into 2005, they started adding more kit as standard as well. The problem was an entry level Indian car is below entry level for an entry level car in Europe. Rover knew that and they took a lot of steps to bring it up to, to par really. And so their problems were kind of twofold. First of all was the initial quality. They had to work hard to make the car good enough and it's, it's an okay car, but it's not quite as good as your position. And the second problem was perception. The public knew about the car's origins and it was also known that Rover were paying around £3,000 per car for this, but they were starting to sell them at six and a half grand minimum, up to seven and a half grand at first. And so the public didn't take kindly to that. They felt they were being ripped off by Rover, who were just cashing in on buying it cheap, flogging it high. And of course, there was the famous Top Gear incident. Rover wouldn't lend Top Gear a car to review. They knew that Top Gear weren't going to be kind to them, no matter how good the car was. So James May went undercover, not very undercover, I have to say. James May and a moustache is still James May. Borrowed one and absolutely slated it. He called it the worst car he'd ever driven in the history of the programme. And that really was a death knell for the car. So why did Rover do this? Why did they put this car into the market in the UK? Well, they hadn't had a proper Super Mini since 1998 when the Metro went off sale. They tried to fill that void with the 200, but then the 25, by doing things like dropping it down to a 1.1 litre. But it 
was typical of their size management. It never quite fitted in any particular category. And so the 25 was taking on everything from the smart car to the Focus. Meanwhile, the 45 was taking everything from the Focus to the Mondeo. It was a sizing system that didn't really work, so they needed something to fill the void. The problem was, the problem was, of course, that Rover, MG Rover by then, the problem was that Rover were squandering money on ridiculous vanity projects, the SVR, the V8 75. They needed to put every penny they had into a new Super Mini and into a replacement for the 2545. But no, they were throwing money in the wrong direction. And if this was a cheap fix that didn't quite last long enough to save the company. In terms of safety, it's as good as you should expect for a city car in the early noughties. Driver airbag came as standard. On the top model, the style, passenger airbag came as standard as well. The other models had that as an option as well. You had side intrusion bars in the doors, pre-tensioners on the seat belts, anti-submarine seats. So it was covering the bases as well as it ought to. Now you might think this car looks relatively European for an Indian car, and that's because it was designed by the IDEA, the Institute of Development of Automotive Engineering. And you know what that means? It means someone really wanted to spell IDEA. Oh, shield gaggy, if you remember that TV show. They're based in Turin, and they're responsible for some pretty good cars. Things like the Alpha 155, the 90s Lancia Delta, the Fiat Tipo, for example. And later on, a lot of smaller cars, such as the uh, Kia Rio, and in fact, the Tata Nano as well. I'd love to get a Tata Nano on here. Oh, we've got a rattle now. We didn't have a rattle before, we've got a rattle now. Despite being quite tall and very, very thin on the back, are pretty comfortable. They're well padded. They've only got basic adjustments of front and back and rake on the rear, but still quite supportive. Not supportive in like a racing seat, but you know, it's nice to sit in. And incredibly, there was a leather option available. And of course, like the steering wheel, that's pigskin as well. It's an astonishingly rare option though. Oh, check out the color on that GTV. Nuvola Blue, that was a really expensive option. So in typical Rover style, it was positioned not quite right in the market. In terms of price, it was up against things like the KA and the uh, Citroen C2. But in terms of size, because it's absolutely massive in here, it is more akin to things like the Fiesta, the Ibiza. So in a way, you could upscale yourself, upsize yourself to a bigger car for less money. So all in all, it's not a bad car. The problem is it's not as good as the rivals, which is something the buying public, I think, were aware of. Buying one now is certainly a curiosity. It's a car to buy because you like Rovers, you like something interesting and different. It's definitely a car worth adding to a collection and having just for posterity because no one else is gonna save them. So hats off to the owner of this car who has bought this car and is looking after it. And when there are very few of these left in not long, this one will still be safe. Well, thanks for joining me today in this, the very last Rover, the City Rover. It's a car I've often thought about, maybe I should add to my collection as like the final piece in the puzzle, if you like. I've never quite done it, maybe I will one day. If you've enjoyed this, please hit like, please hit subscribe, all the usual things, share on Facebook, share on Twitter, you know the drill. And see you again next time, driving something completely different. Also looking at this. Is the engine bigger than you thought? Exactly what I expected. Mm -hmm.